Hi. There we go. I fell in love with natural history collections after taking a course in mammalogy with John Anderson my freshman year. As a student, I have focused in biology with an integration of social sciences and policy. I have spent an enormous amount of time working in mammal collections in DC and New York City, and I have been a work-study student in the George B. Dora Museum for three years. What I study is an applied version of ethnobiology, which is most commonly the study of uses, categorizations, and knowledges of plants and animals, usually known as ethnobotany and mostly focusing on plants. Ethnozoology is far less common and rarely incorporates archival methods or policies. In planning my senior project, I was really interested in both human-animal and community researcher relationships. And I took a field course with um, Heath Cabot in ethnography to gain a better understanding of relevant issues of perspective and context. I drafted a very general abstract for the American Anthropological Association conference where I knew I would be presenting my research. Um, and I did this because I didn't want to really project my own interests on my project planning. Um, I preferred to let emic uh, concepts come out of my primary text materials and to develop research themes based on evolving coding methodologies. So basically, I kind of went into it blind a little bit, just hoping something interesting would come out of the text. This is Indicator Indicator, um, also known as the Greater Honey Guide, which really exemplifies many of the themes that came out of my primary sources. To provide a greater context for the interdisciplinary relationships that I am interested in, I am going to read a quote regarding the Honey Guide from Theodore Roosevelt's memoir, African Game Trails. John Burroughs, an American naturalist, was inclined to disbelieve the reality of its existence. Every experienced hunter and every native who lives in the wilderness has again and again been an eyewitness of it. Some of the men beg to be allowed to follow it. The natives believe that misfortune will follow any failure on their part to leave the honeybird its share of the booty. They also insist that sometimes the honeybird will lead a man to a serpent or a wild beast. And sure enough, Dr. Mearns was once led up to a rhinoceros. I selected the Smithsonian Roosevelt Africa Exploring Expedition for my investigation because of the resources that were available to me while working in DC. The archives of the Smithsonian Institution and the expertise of Darren Lundy, collections manager of mammals, who has just completed a biography of Theodore Roosevelt. This expedition took place between 1909 and 1910 in Eastern Africa and consisted of Theodore Roosevelt, his son Kermit, <coughs> naturalists John Alden Loring, Edmund Heller, and Edgar Mearns, and hundreds of porters. In my research, I drew from, from published memoirs relating to the expedition, Roosevelt's well-known African game trails, and Loring's African adventure stories as well as Heller's field notes, which are housed in the mammal division at the Smithsonian. I also consulted ethnographic texts from the Smithsonian's Warren M. Robbins African Art Library and photographs from the Smithsonian archives. I carefully coded these texts for excerpts relating to human-animal relationships, which did surface as a major theme, which is really exciting because that is what I was interested in to begin with. Most of the ethnobiological information that emerged focused on animals, and I categorized it into two groups, direct human ecological associations, which refers to how people perceive and interact with wildlife, and then biological and behavioral information, which is most commonly known as traditional ecological knowledge, which results from direct observations of fauna. The aforementioned quotes about the honey guide exemplify the first theme, the second is seen within the following quote, which is also from African Game Trails. Bongo are said to eat bark, but this our Dorobo denied. They are also said to be nocturnal, but the Dorobo said that they never fed at night. I, of course, know nothing about this personally. I see my studies as a natural integration of complex networks, where what we might perceive as a tale of a possibly mythical bird that leads men to honey is really a window into the honey-centric livelihood of the Dorobo, ornithology, entomology, agriculture, 
social systems, trade networks, and more. The most effective way to regulate these networks may be through integrated feedback systems in research, policy making, and implementation, which requires understanding perceptions of and interactions with wildlife. I came to this awareness during this and other research projects, my time at the Smithsonian, classes at COA, and my immersion into policy. My senior project posed questions related to past and present trends of poaching and the ivory trade in Eastern Africa. Exporting animals is trade, by definition, and collecting for natural history museums falls into a distinct subcategory of the wildlife trade. This March, I served as the first United States youth delegate to the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, where it was obvious that there is a need for a more interdisciplinary understanding of these issues. To conclude, this summer I plan to be working with the Biodiversity Research Institute on a bat survey project. In the more distant future, I hope to stay engaged in the wildlife trade arena, and I would like to facilitate policies that integrate both science and communities. I never would have reached these conclusions at any other institution. COA was the only college that I applied to, and I think it was because I knew I could do something really important here. Thank you very much, and I would like to open the floor up for questions.